I didn't originally go for communications. I went for environmental analysis and policy. Um, and then I had an internship out in LA at White House Post. Um, and I was like, film is like, I always wanted to do that. I just didn't know how to do it or like what was the path. Welcome back to the Votary Podcast, everyone. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Tucker Bliss, an NYC-based director known for his ability to tell relatable human stories, often with a touch of humor. As a filmmaker, Tucker has made his name in commercials and short films, winning awards at Cannes, Young Guns, and The One Show. With his short film Monster Factory premiering at Tribeca and South by Southwest, and is currently in series production at Apple TV+. Tucker studied cinematography at Boston University and has worked and collaborated with big names like Google, Facebook, and Apple. But don't be fooled by his impressive resume. Tucker isn't one to take himself too seriously. He just wants to make you laugh, cry, or maybe even both with his work. So without further ado, Tucker Bliss, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, super stoked Glad to, to have here. you here. So turns out word is that you're somewhat of a local legend to Boston. I, I am. I am. I'm a, I'm a t- terrier. Be you pride. I love it. So did you grow up in the area or what, what made you choose Boston? I went to, I don't know how I had settled on Boston. I think it was like the most uh, prestigious communication school I could find uh, in the Boston area. I was trying to go to NYU, but I ended up going there. I'm, I'm definitely glad I went to school in Boston. I feel like it's, uh, you don't taste too big of a city too early, which can kind of lead to destruction and, and, peaking too early with like, I don't know, New New York's great now for me, but I think if I was here during my college years, it would have been a lot, but Boston was amazing. And you're right there with Emerson and uh, you kind of share all the film professors with all the other film schools. So it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty, a great place to go to school. Yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. So what got you into directing? It says that you studied cinematography at uh, Boston. Yeah. I actually, so I went to school, I'd always done like video stuff, like I had a videos class in, um, in high school, uh, and was making like skate videos and like jackass style videos, as I'm sure like so many people were, um, and that, then I went to college actually for, I didn't originally go for communications. I went for environmental analysis and policy. Um, and then I had an internship out in LA at white house post. Um, and I was like, film is like, I always wanted to do that. I just didn't know how to do it or like, what was the path? And then I sort of saw people in their twenties, like working at like one of the biggest post-production places. And I was like, oh, this is like actually pretty attainable. So then I changed my major. I had to take some summer courses to like catch up since I was starting late. Um, and then, yeah, it was sort of like in our class, we each had to pick a role and I I always like editing. So I, I did a lot of that, uh, out of college as well. Um, but yeah, I I just cinematography felt like the most hands-on learn the cameras. And we were still, we were like the last year to use film and the first year to use Alexa. So it was like, I got to shoot on super 16 and Alexa in the same thesis film class. So you kind of learn, all the old stuff and all the new stuff. Maybe we didn't learn the new stuff enough because our professors <laughs> hadn't, hadn't used the camera yet. And we we're like, I remember we shot our whole, one of our whole thesis films like in Rec 709, like not log, like we're sort of like <laughs> locked into the look, but they didn't know how to use it, neither did we. So but it, it, it ended up looking, it looked very fine. I wasn't showing you in it now, but um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good learning lesson. Yeah, uh, that's where our two stories kind of differ a little bit because I didn't actually go to film school. And what's crazy is you were part of my film school. Um, I my film school was Vimeo. I yeah, I spent, same for me. Like that yeah. came out. Vimeo was like really kind of hit when I was like a I think I was a junior or senior. No, I was a senior, and like I remember seeing like. Elliot Roush put out like some film about uh, I think it was like last minutes with Oda and it was about like this uh, this guy had to put down his dog and the dog had always like been there for him and he was he, he fought through addictions so and I was like shot on like 7D or something I was like okay like first of all I gotta go 7D 
yep. uh, or a 5D. <laughs> and then, yeah, and that sort of changed. Like, I don't think I'd be doing this without like, I don't want to, I don't want to say that film, but I think just the like small Vimeo culture in general, that was like, Oh, you can just go just get one of these SLR cameras, like go shoot some stuff. Like you don't need a lot of money. Like, so that's kind of what I did for the first like four years after I graduated. It was like, I had my 5d and I did like Craigslist jobs and Mandy jobs and like shot yeah. like so many bad music videos and documentaries, and, <laughs> <laughs> but it was like so fun too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change any of it. I think it was like, you learned a lot through like a lot of failure and like erasing memory cards and like all these nightmare situations, but like now it doesn't happen anymore, you know? And it's, yeah. but it was kind of all on you too. I liked that sort of one man band thing. And I had a few friends that would do it with me, but uh, we were kind of out there in the wild west. So, so. That's, that's the beautiful part of this art. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I had I had plenty of those films that I'd say attribute to my passion for film and Wind Rivers Rise was one of them uh, that like f- lit a fire under me for documentary hybrid style like commercial filmmaking. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And so when we started this here um, at Votary Story Growth and it was on me to kind of open this this project of case studies and studying like these types of commercial films. I immediately went to Wind Rivers Rise and I was like, we got it. We got to do that as an episode. Um, yeah. And so I just, I have so many questions. Like what initially drew you to that project? Uh, so that was supposed to be a pilot for a Google, like online platform show. And so the company I used to work at, um, First Avenue Machine, um, we we had like an in-house agency called Special Guest. Um, okay. And we would work like directly with Facebook and Google. And it was sort of like ideas and then execution. So I was usually like on the creative directing side. Like we come up with like 10 ideas or 10 serious ideas. And then we'd go. At that. That's kind of how I got to actually direct things. Because for the most part of like your early 20s, if you're not, if you haven't done it before, no one's going to let you do it. So yeah, I think the nice thing about working at special guests is like, I wrote the thing. So, and I'm picking the directors. I was like, I pick, I pick me. <laughs> like, I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> uh, so we kind of, I kind of wrote myself in, into like being able to do the work that I wanted to do. Um, and documentary, like I, I never like really wanted to, like, I like doing documentaries, but it's it to me now I'm like, I never want to do it again. And the only reason is because it's like, the way doc worked was like, it feels like easier in inception and then harder in execution and finishing mm-hmm. versus mm-hmm. like, so you kind of put off the problem for later. And the problem is like the creation of the thing. So you just go oh, out and get a bunch of stuff. Um, so a lot of like agencies back in the day, I think like, we're like, Oh, this is like such an easy way to like get ideas approved. We'll go make something. And then like, you will just figure it out later. Right. So that now that now that's kind of my nightmare, and I try to stay away from that because it just is so. There's so much anxiety in that. Uh, one of the biggest, smallest jobs I've ever done, where it was like we had the like money resources to like go do it right, but like it it was like their creative director and art director, and then like me and a cinematographer just like in the middle of nowhere. Like that was sort of it. And the producers <laughs> would like just make sure like the whole village wouldn't like come in because our, our first day we got there, we're like. We just want to be nimble. This is like a documentary. We need like a camera, me and the monitor and a sound guy. Let's like keep it like super chill. <laughs> and I like turned around at one point. We're in this like tiny little mud hut and there's like 200 people, like crew and everything. I was like, this is not that. Like we're not <laughs> making a feature film. We're not making a commercial. So it kind of got in the way. But um, yeah, it was it was like an eye-opening production experience, life experience. India is like such a wild crazy place did they did they come to you with the project or because you you said yeah that was like i I forget how it came about i think yeah i think that was like moderately fully fledged like more so than normally what we do um and yeah i think uh, we knew it was gonna be in india we knew it was about flooding but we didn't know like how what the structure would be like how long they were supposed to be who we were going to interview um so we sent out like a podcast like 
radio interviewer to just go canvas like all these different towns and all that part of the country that was like suffering from all the flooding and he just met all these people and then we Mm -hmm. sort of devised like okay these are like the backbones and I think the biggest thing for me is like it's the series itself was like quite scientific um yeah and like didn't really have that human element like going into it so that was like something that we ended up saying like you kind of need a little bit of like human context for us to like like as an audience like understand like first of all who this is impacting like what does it mean for floods to come up like nine feet like for a person you know like because you could say nine feet and you don't really it doesn't sound like that much but if your house is at one foot of like it's at sea level like it's fully underwater um and yeah it was it was really really intense there just like talking with all the people kind of going through it and like it's it's not just the flood it's usually like the after effects of the flooding like stuff gets ruined and destroyed but um like the mold in the houses was like making all these people sick and we'd be interviewing like the main kid's dad like he got sick like during our interview it was like wow. growing up and like we had to pause and yeah it's just like a pretty dire situation over there in the pre-production process you had uh, a lot of uh as the director a lot of pull to shape it in a certain way where you needed that human element and they listened to you yeah yeah and we like i think with most docs like earlier i probably wouldn't have done this but i started like kind of religiously storyboarding documentary just so we could like know what we needed to tell the story do like an animatic like have an idea and what i started doing around then and i i forget why i did this and i did this for another google project where like it was sort of like, let's just take, let's take the talking head interview out of it and like, let's do a radio edit. So like, I had been watching like a lot of This American Life and Radio Lab, and I was like, why don't we just like edit a Radio Lab episode and then like we're finding visuals to match that. We might come back to like interview setups, but it's more like portraiture. So you like understand like, or you feel these people versus like just seeing them talk like a traditional uh, documentary. Brilliant. So so that was sort of like that's like the treatment, the director's treatment to like kind of, again, get like as much as, cause I feel like, like for certain things you want to see talking head interviews and that's great. Like I'm not against talking head interviews. Uh, but I think for this, it's like, if we want to like see what's happening, like we kind of have to be there. And the more time we're in a talking head interview in a studio or like away from the location, the less visuals you can see like on the ground. So yeah, it's, it's sort of like the idea is there and then it's it's you're coming up with like how you see it and then we have to sell that through and then that gets sold up to their boss and their boss and their boss and it's sort of, yeah, it's, that's usually the process. And then as you do more and more projects and I'm definitely like finally starting to feel this, there's like a lot more trust uh, where instead of saying like, this is what needs to be done and people being like, why? And you're like, because <laughs> like, you're like, because I've done this before. Like, here's a project I've done yeah. like exactly yeah. like this. See, you can actually trust me. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's more, a little more collaborative now. Like once, once you get that ball rolling a little bit and have some experience. That's brilliant with the whole radio interview thing. Um, that, that the other Google, well, one of the other Google commercials you did, the pixel bud Two, I think that's yeah. like, one of my all time favorite commercials because the pacing of it, but it has those interviews in it. Did you do that radio interview type? Yeah, we did. Yeah, exactly. We like, I I think in that I had, like I have interview setups, but we didn't ask the questions there. And like, that was like my saving grace, like, because I didn't have that option in post, like I couldn't, the client couldn't say like, can we just show interview here? So it was like, we have all these things that should be interview setups. And I only shot portraits and like verite dialogue. So it's like me messing around with talent or like, it's like, again, it's like that story should be very dry and it's about tech and it's like really boring. And like, but let's meet the people that made the headphones. So then like, if we humanize it, like that's different than what say Apple's doing or like, like, it becomes a little more like human quirky, like, okay, there's people behind technology. There's like, they have families, like this lady was pregnant while she was designing. Like, it just makes you kind of feel the process a little bit more. My editor, Dylan Edwards, who's incredible. Um, but he did, he's done like everything for me. Um, yeah. 
he yeah we did like a full radio edit like just with pre-interview dialogue and like made sure it all paced out and then it was like we know exactly what shots we need so it's all kind of in the can already and then you yeah. you go execute obviously things change on the day and you get better shots but i think like with everything i do i try to like prepare as much as possible beforehand like make sure it like works so you're not saying like ah oh, shit like i, I wish I wish we had gotten this. It's less of that problem. It's more like, okay, we, we had our backbone. We know it works. Now it's like, we have that freedom to like, okay, let's go get some extra shots or like this person's being weird. Like, let's just film them. (laughs) You kind (laughs) of prepare for that unprepared. Uh, So that's, that's usually like my mantra for just trying to find unique stuff by preparing. Yeah, no, that's amazing. The you can really tell the pacing of that film was so thoroughly thought out. So with w- Wind River's Rise, did you feel like you had full creative freedom? W- were there some constraints where you were like, "Man, like I really wish I could do this, but creative over at Google is not really." Uh, that was yeah, it was like a little bit of a uh, tug of war with the humanity element because we were like opening with the like story of the kid uh, and like one of the creative directors loved that but then like her boss wasn't like was like let's just get to the story but he was a director also so it was like this thing where like I, I don't know if it was like these are like accurate notes I'm being given or like it's like what he would do so it's 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 like two visions sort of like combating and he wasn't there with us so he didn't like know the like gravity of the situation so um yeah that that was like a a longer process like selling and that again that's like coming back to that like i hadn't done that before and i was like a little bit younger and like didn't have the pull that i might have now where i'm trying to convince someone of something through like having done it before so it was like me saying trust me is like it's not as it's not as reliable of the source as it maybe is now Um, right but yeah, it was, I think there was like, a, a again, like a little bit of like a, how science-y do they want to go? And like, how human do I want to go? Like, I don't really care about like all the stats, you know, like, like it, I think you could tell it as a human story, stats like maybe exist as an article. So yeah, it was like that balance. But I think with like the infographics, we kind of got like a interesting like representation of it that still felt like something you'd want to watch. It doesn't feel like, like... 2d overlay that's kind of boring and dry yeah absolutely so i feel like this is a common theme with a lot of commercial work because commercial work is trying to sell a product and the product usually is stat based unless it's like you know a, a mug which also that's stat based how do you think that human based element has a place in every single commercial or are there certain commercials where it's like, well, maybe we don't need the human based element and we just can stick with the stats here. Uh, yes. I think those exist. I don't really do them. So it's, it's kind of like, I I used to for sure. I think I'm like fortunate enough now that I've like done enough of what I like doing that. Like every pitch I get now or every board that comes in is like, it's got these like four words that are like my like keywords. So like my sales reps and companies like just send them to me. So it's like authentic, like cheeky, like human, like sometimes dialogue driven stories. And like, you'd see them in the like description of the product. I'm like, okay, that's why, why that came to me. And, and it's amazing now because it used to be sort of like, I'll take what I can get. A lot of the time it's like a very serious, like pensive or like, I don't know, like some guy staring out of a window like, and it's more serious piece. I'm just like, not that serious of a, of a guy. Yeah. Uh, so I was, I was sort of like emulating my peers, um, which felt like, of course we're doing commercials. You don't really have that much control of like, like what you should be doing. So you're kind of like happy to be working. And like, of course I was, but it was sort of like, I feel like I'm not good at it because it's not really what my taste. So I'm like, I'm, I'm scouring Vimeo and instead of like doing what I want to do or what I think is right. I'm like, here's what this guy did. He got a staff pick and like, it, it just started to feel like, well, this person's better than me. So like, then I feel like a worse director. Um, Cause you're not really going with your gut. You're like, what, what's, 
so and so's gut would right. tell him to do like what or her like what would she film in this scenario like is it the basketball rolling and slow-mo on fire like i was just like my brain doesn't really work like that uh so yeah it was like it was kind of interesting to and i that's like where special guests and first step was great because i started creative directing and i was like okay i want to do the human stuff like a little more cheeky a little bit of like humor as well um so i gotta write that so then i wrote like a a Google piece that was like in that world. I wrote like a beer piece that was also in that world. Uh, and then, yeah, sort of like, just again, like you, because you did it once, now you can do it. And now like every project's like that. And it all has like some version of that. Obviously there's like a spectrum of genre, but um, kind of like play within that and like make it your own. And, and then it's fun to like play in full genre too. Like I just did a musical last week. So it's not something I've ever would have thought I would do, but it was like still, it's still in my world. Like, but it's like my version of a musical uh, and it's commercial. So it's kind of interesting. I look forward to seeing that for sure. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, So your cotton project died in wool, big fan, love the film, the four by three shot on film. Um, That's a little bit more serious. Um, Do you feel like that's a true representation of your work? Is that, uh, that again, that was probably like, okay, like I gotta, I gotta create, like it, it wanted to be that, like there's yeah. some like human element in there, like a little bit, but oh, it's yeah. like not like a funny story, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think like that might be one of those ones that like maybe this year, if I like something that's coming out soon, that, that one will make its way to the archive. Uh, yeah. I, I definitely, I definitely enjoy it, but it's like, I think that world for me is just like, I don't feel that at home there. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, but it is, it's fun to create, like create beauty, but I'd rather like create beauty in like a fun, more playful narrative way. Uh, But that was like a sort of nightmare project. (laughs) So like what you, (laughs) what you see on Vimeo is not what we went there to go shoot. So it was like, that was us fighting the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, back to wind rivers rise did you how did you make it feel so grand while having such a bare bones crew um because it does feel really large scale Um, yeah i think anamorphic was like that kind of you put an anamorphic lens on a camera and put it on the ground and the that putting it on the ground feels epic so i think that's like an easy (laughs) that was like always the kind of cheat code for making like documentaries feel like more like movies than documentaries Right. Um, I think pairing back like how we shot, um, it was mostly like a little more like guided, like on sticks, dolly or steady cam. Um, mm-hmm. There's an occasional handheld stuff here and there, like depending on the scene. But yeah, I think it was being a little more like precise with how we're shooting it. Um, and then again, that, that kind of went back to like, okay, it's storyboarded. So we're not like out there like spray and pray, like, let's see yeah. what we get and, and then figure it out later um and then we had my friends um little uh it was like a not a bolex uh a canon scoop x like super 16 like um little film camera so i just kind of had that as like this textural thing so i think that added like a little bit of like scale of like types of footage i yeah. think like if you have like a little mixed media it always like makes something feel a little bit bigger than it is um but yeah i think i think it was really like taking a step back and getting like more quality shots than like sorry less less shots but more quality versus more shots less quality like can we make what would normally be like a five minute like handheld like get whatever you can thing into like let's just get two great shots here and like that's all we really need if, if they're long too yeah um, yeah and that was something too that the editor that he's like tends to do um is like just leaning into like just sitting in something for longer than maybe you should um mm-hmm. and it sort of feels a little more immersive so like mm-hmm. if we have a steady cam shot that's following this kid like let's just hold on that we don't need to get like a million different shots and coverage like let's just live in it um, yeah but yeah, I think, and then India itself, like, it kind of feels like these epic locations, but everything felt epic there, you know? So yeah. it was sort of like the scale is the place. Um, yeah. So you can, 
this is not a revolutionary thought or anything, but it is really what's in front of the camera. Like, like yeah. there's yeah. so many times where I'm like, I'll be shooting a commercial in like Ditmas Park or something in New York. And it's like, this feels like small. And it's like, well, you're shooting in like a tiny house in like South Brooklyn. Like it's, it's not going to feel big. Like no yeah. matter what you do, you know, it's, yeah. it's, you're sort of beholden them to what you're shooting. Yeah, no, absolutely. I love, I love the less shots, more quality. Yeah. And I feel Are like there... people get bogged down in like gear as well. Like, and that's like kind of to that point, like I might back in the day have gotten mad at a DP or like my lens choice or the camera choice because I shot in Dimas Park. And I'm like, why doesn't this look like this amazing, like Volvo, like commercial I saw that was shot in Sweden with like with all the scale. And I'm like, well, it must have been the because I shot red and I didn't shoot Alexa. It must be because I used super speeds and didn't shoot Tribe Seven, or whatever. Like or Panavision, like. Yeah. And then you're like, and I used to blame all that stuff. Or like, I'm never working with that DP again. Like they didn't make this look epic. I'm like, well, they, what? What are they gonna do? You know, like they, they this house yeah. sucks. So like, there's only <laughs> so much we could do. Uh, but yeah, that, that's sort of a lesson I've learned over the years for sure. That's so funny. Um, how did you choose uh, which shots were going to be film, which shots were going to be um, anamorphic? That was sort of like, while my DP friend Anthony was shooting, I would just like, I had it with me and I would just go like, because I, I get really stressed if I'm not shooting. So like huh. if I'm watching them set up camera, I'm like hovering. It's like watching a water boil and I get like really anxious and I so I just yeah. I just bought a Komodo so I like have something in my hands to like get extra shots now or else yeah. I actually like have I like panic. Uh, I'm like really <laughs> annoying to DP. I'm like let's go, oh. let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, so that's what I kind of had that film camera for. I was like let me go get like these little like human close ups like hands, fire, like the stuff you you need for the edit, but the the stuff you don't really have time for in the schedule. So that's sort of like yeah. where that came in. And that's the same with the Komodo now. Like, it's just like, I don't need an AC for it. Like I just get one lens and then like you get these weird shots and you get a lot more coverage and it's like, it's sort of a, a little insurance policy. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I love the Komodo. I think it's genius. I, I just, yeah, it's great. I, I got one recently too. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's great. It's great. It's so small. So do you ever feel in the edit suite, that there isn't enough shots or because you said you'll just hold on a shot to make it feel a little bit more grand, but is there ever a scenario where it's like, ah, feeling a little short with the uh, shots? Uh, not as much anymore. I mean, I'll like, I'll have funny moments in the edit where you're like, God damn, like, I really like did not cover that scene. Like how I should have, or like, I wish I had this close up to make yeah. it make sense. But it's kind of like a fleeting moment. I feel like that's just your first inclination when you're trying to problem solve like one thing and you might get like kind of down on yourself. And I'm like, oh, I like, I really, I really messed that up. But you give it a day and like, there's like 10 different solutions. And yeah. um, I think when you look back at it, you don't really remember any of those moments anyway. You're like, just one shot of like a coin falling on the ground or something like that. Like I can now go do that. Just get yeah. back to the lens. And it's, it looks very similar so yeah so with the with the bare bones crew did um how much gear did you have was it one of those scenarios i've been in like plenty of like documentary scenarios where you you have so much gear and you're like oh man, yeah like you're sweating bullets and you're like how the heck like you can't feel how it's gonna feel in the edit you're just like i, I just need to get the shot and you're like you're killing yourself yeah. you know did yeah. it feel like that or did you guys have a pretty good like so, uh a little bit uh we had like uh, the best flow we could have india is like quite difficult in general yeah. um i think the nice there's two there's a nice thing and a bad thing it's the same the same thing but there is so many people employed by production there because it's like a great way to pay crew and and get people like decent wages and whatnot but that yeah. meant we had like our micro crew has like five first ACs, you know, and none of them could pull focus on the right. job, which we found out on the last day, like we're talking to our production manager who lives there and hired all the crew. He's like, like, we were like, I, I pulled focus the whole time. So I'd have like the fizz and was like actually pulling focus because the guys we had there couldn't pull focus. 
and we t- got told like the day we're leaving, they're like, they're like, why don't you guys ever use the focus puller? We're like, what do you mean? Like, we had a focus puller. Like, <laughs> we're like, who are who are these five first ACs? They're like, those are just the camera guys. Like, we're like, what? Like, so it's kind of like it, we had a lot of support. It was just like there's different like ways of doing things in different countries and different titles and whatnot. So it was like a little bit figuring that. So I didn't really feel like the, and I definitely have felt this in the past. Like, like if I'm like, it's an actual bare bones crew and it's like me, sound guy, whatever. Um, if I'm shooting, like there's all the cases and like, then you are focused on like logistical stuff and creative. And it's like kind of super overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and then and you do get that panic. You're like, uh, like we just need to be filming. Like, it doesn't matter what we're filming. Like, if I'm not filming, like, I'm screwed. And, like, the edit's <laughs> going to be terrible. Uh, so it was less of that, but it was, like, different overwhelmingness. Uh, and, again, like, I need to be – I like to be – especially with Doc, I think one thing that, like, I don't miss. And, like, this is, like, the most stressful part of it. And maybe it kind of goes along with I need to be filming all the time. Is like, you'd be – you're driving to a location and you're, like, everything you see is a great shot and you're like i just like i can't handle this like i yeah. i i need like focus because like yeah and if it's commercial narrative like there's only the story is about a guy lighting a candle in a room that's what the story is about with documentary you're like i'm in india the story is about india like and everything could be a shot and it's becomes this like it's really overwhelming um it is and then you you kind of have fomo the entire time and yeah. Most of the shots would probably be terrible and not make sense in the edit, but like they could be great. And they're reminding you of something you saw in Vimeo or some movie. Or right. <laughs> yeah. So you said you storyboarded. To what extent did you storyboard? Were there any shots that you got um, that weren't storyboarded? Yeah, you, for sure. Uh, did you did you location I think we, like, scout? Planned as much as we could. Yeah, we location scouted like all over the country um, the week before. So I was there for like two and a half weeks. I think. Um, so yeah, we scouted, checked stuff out, then did like board changes based on the new locations, like some new shot thoughts and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think with like branded content documentaries, like where I like, I'm beholden to a client, like I had to, you kind of have to get all that approved. Like I can go shoot extra right. stuff on the day and like, that's, they want that obviously. But I think like going in with no plan is like definitely scary for like a brand so you you kind of got to get all that approved and then but yeah again like i said earlier it's like we have our shots that we need that we know make the story and like everything's like good to go and then it's it's finding those like momentary magic things that like pop up like just to the left of camera or if you keep rolling on something or you find someone you're like let's just go follow them and this cow down to the river or like in one rivers rides for instance the two guys walking into the river um, on steady cam, like mm-hmm. we just saw them. We we're like, can we just follow you? So we just like shot them. Like that wasn't Amazing. planned. And that's like one of my favorite parts of the film. So uh, yeah, it's, I think uh, you prepare to be surprised basically. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I know this is like a, this is like, there's always something that you would do differently, but is there something specifically that you're like, man, I wish I did this differently? Far enough past it now that I, I don't get like cringed out by anything. Um, right, right, right. Then that's usually my like barometer for like wishing I had done something differently if I like can't watch it for like a few years. Uh, but that <laughs> one, I think we, yeah, I think we like did what we needed to do with that project. I think there's, I think sometimes with doc and, and then with other projects as well, like I'll get like a little too excited about shots mm-hmm. versus story. Um, so there was like a lot of stuff from that, that like I knew we didn't need, but like I wanted the shot and then mm-hmm. we didn't use it in the edit. And so I think stuff like that, I, I wish I, that's the only regret I have. I think it's filming stuff. I know we didn't need just cause of like, aesthetic ego or like i'm here like might as well get it and then it ends up like sucking out like two hours from like time you actually needed for something else to make that seem great um that's interesting but that's sort of like across the board so yeah now i try as much as possible like make an animatic first like 
see that you don't actually need that shot and like get rid of it, get it off the schedule because that's going to be like, you get your schedule back. Like I have 10 minutes per shot. and like, these are like 40 minute shots each. So it's like not feasible. So you're kind of screwing yourself for the spot by trying to like get this crazy shot. That's not necessary. So, yeah, no, absolutely. So is there anything it's, it's difficult to kind of know the effect of a film. I feel like a lot of times it's kind of just like, well done here, here it is. Um, yeah. Move on. Do you, do you know what the impact was like? Did Google share any of that with you? Yeah, I think they had posted like analytics on that. Um, and I think there was like a standalone site for a little bit. Um, awesome. And then, and then we posted our version of it, um, which wasn't that different. I think we just colored and like added a scene or something like that um, mm. to Vimeo. And we got in trouble because Vimeo is a YouTuber competitor. Uh, and, oh, but that got staff, staff picked and we had to take it down like a day after it got staff picked. So we got like... To, I don't know. I think it was like 20,000 views or something. And then I was like, yes, like we're, we're riding up. And then we have to take it down. I was like, no, like I, I worked so hard on this. Like this would have been like a nice little bump for the career, but it is yeah, what it is. It's awesome. So, okay. This is, this is maybe a, a question outside of that scope, more of commercial filmmaking as a whole. So in, in the current climate that things are, I feel like things are getting a lot more fast paced. Like we have mm-hmm. TikTok, we have Reels, we have YouTube Shorts, which are these like sixty seconds tops yep. things. In this world that you're in of commercial filmmaking and authentic human storytelling, where's where, does that still have a place in this new world, or are they are they just going to be two separate things, and it's it's going to be okay? They can work in tandem. Yeah, I think they work in tandem. I think uh, I think Quibi is a great example of like thinking yeah. like TikTok and and having that mentality from like a older perspective. Like the kids are watching six second clips, so like content needs to be six seconds. And it's like, well, those kids also watch Euphoria, and like those people also listen to Joe Rogan. You know, like I think, and then and then guess what's on. TikTok, it's clips of like Theo Vaughn and Joe Rogan and all these people that are doing long format. It's like there's short format within long format. Um, so yeah, it doesn't like scare me. I think it's like it seems like a a perspective of Gen X or whoever's above me, um, of boomers. <laughs> it's like boomer yeah. perspective, you know. Like yeah. I think there's sh- there's short within long, um, and yeah, I think podcasts have sort of shown us that like. People don't like, yes, of course it's dopamine hits to watch like TikTok. Like I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone. Um, but I think like if I'm on a car ride, if I'm on a commute, like I don't, I don't want to be doing that the whole time. I want to like invest in something and like learn something. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't think long formats going anywhere. I, and I love short format too. So it's, it's always like a fun challenge to do both. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been amazing. I have a few more questions that are more you specific filmmaker kind of insider. Um, I've been really into like kind of ritual kind of just like, let me have something in my life where I do every day that keeps me grounded, you know, Uh, making coffee in the morning, making tea, going on a walk. What's a ritual in your life uh, that you hold on to that keeps you kind of grounded? I do the same thing every day. Uh, get up. I walk to get coffee with or without my dog. Uh, yeah. She's not with, she's at my parents right now. Uh, so I was away this week. Uh, Sweet. Go to the coffee place, come back, go to my office in my apartment. I just sort of stay here for until six or so. Uh, I try to like make it feel like I'm going to work. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, it's, it's sort of that, like, I, I love not doing anything when I'm home. Um, cause I'm traveling a lot. My routine is kind of boring, but it's, it's, that's my life, you know? Um, uh, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's like a little balance. I think I like 
I like comedic directors like a lot. I think um, Yorgos is like I, I love his work. Uh, I think of the Vimeo people, I've always like. I think Christopher Borgley, like I don't know, I saw like Whatever Us or something like back in the day, and I was like, this dude's just like in another world. But he was like, he's like my age, so I'm like, fuck, I gotta like, <laughs> I gotta step it up. But but uh, I just saw his new movie with Nick Cage, um, and. Yeah, I think it's like it's cool to see some Vimeo people who like started maybe not doing, and he just did a DJ interview too. It's like it's pretty interesting to listen to. Like he was doing commercials as too, and he was doing more serious work back in the day, and then now he's doing um, comedy and like what he wants to do. So it's like it's it's inspiring in that way where it's we all sort of started from a similar place, and like you kind of take what you can get in your twenties, and then. Um, it's kind of it's kind of up to you to take the reins at some point and say like I don't really actually like doing that or like this is, doesn't feel great that I'm doing like serious like montage commercials like how do I how do I get out of that um, so yeah I think I like them as modern directors I also like Martin McDonough I think it's hilarious like in Bruges is like an all time favorite. Um, and then P.T. Anderson, like, obviously, well, that's hard to not like. But I like the range of his stuff, too. Like, Boogie Nights is, like, beautiful and also hilarious. So I think it's I, that that combo is usually my favorite, where it, it can look like an amazing film, but also be, like, very reverent and hilarious. And, well, yeah. So what are what what could be some shout-outs for you? What are some things that the people can look out for? Uh, I just did a short film that's uh, doing the festival thing right now. Um, it took took a while. It was like a three year thing, and it's more expensive than I thought it was going to be. Um, so yeah, I was like, I think the whole process. I'm like, how do people pay for all this stuff? Like, it's crazy. Like, I don't even. Know, you have to like buy your way into making films. Like, like now I understand why everyone's like a nepo baby and like their parents pay for everything. Like, this is like, <laughs> I felt broke this year. Like everything I made with commercials, I was like, I got to put right back into short film. But um, I think for me, it's like, I, no one's going to let me make a film until I make a film. And like, it's that like cart before the horse. Like if you haven't done it, you're not going to do it. So you got to, yeah. I think I was sort of like exercising that. Um and then yeah, I'm just I've just been cranking on commercials and things are kind of getting scale wise a little bit bigger and like more in my world. So that's yeah, that's sort of where I'm at. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. If you want to learn more about the film Wind Rivers Rise, we have an essay breakdown video on our YouTube channel. We'll link it in the description below. And if you want to learn more about Votary's story growth or work with Votary, there's another link for that too. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or jump in the comments and let's discuss Wind Rivers Rise. Until next time, stay curious, stay creative, and keep telling your stories.